good. All right. Hello. Hello. Uh, it's good to be back and see so many familiar faces and some new ones. Uh, my name is Ted, for you who, who don't know me. Uh, I'm currently working as uh, VP of engineering, but I originally have a background in uh, teaching. So I used to teach uh, high school kids maths and physics. Uh, I currently work for a startup called Engage Rocket. We build uh, uh, HR product suites uh, out of block uh, 79. Uh, so if you're looking for a job as a junior developer and you're interested in learning more about the particular challenges that we're having in our company, you can either come talk to me after the, the presentation or you can ping me on one of the many Singapore Slack channels. I'm also involved with uh, some of the local uh, communities. We're looking for speakers for Ruby uh, SG. So if you are interested in giving a talk, you can either talk to me or William or Daniel uh, after the presentation. Uh, the Tech Ladies Bootcamp are looking for uh, mentors and coaches. So if you're interested in that, you can talk to, to not, not Elisha, but uh, the, the girl beside her. <laughs> uh, I'm also on the core team of Rubocop, uh, which is a static code uh, analysis tool for Ruby. Uh, we're looking for new contributors, so if you're interested in open source but you don't really know uh, where to start and you would like someone to help you out, you can uh, also come and talk to me after the presentation. So this talk is titled, How Not to Become a Senior Developer. Uh, not to be confused with how to not become a senior developer, which is, don't, just don't do it. Uh, <laughs> this suggests that there are several approaches and that some might be better than, than the others. Uh, so when I, was, when I was writing this presentation, it came out as a sort of stream of consciousness thing and it didn't want to conform to any other format because the ideas inside are a bit uh, interconnected. Uh, so I just try, try to make it as coherent uh, as possible. And what I want to do is reveal a little bit uh, about how I reason about my work as a VP engineering and the work of uh, our programmers and our field in, in general. Uh, and some of these ideas might not apply to you directly, and that is fine. Uh, the point is not in the, the details of the ideas, really. Uh, it's in the reasoning about the ideas. And I'm hoping to help you get a bigger picture of uh, whatever context you're working in right now and your journey to becoming a, a senior developer. So uh, the talk might be slightly uh, mislabeled because I will only talk very briefly about how I think you should not become a, a senior developer. Uh, so one of the most uh, popular and, uh, according to me, probably the most incorrect way uh, is uh, just list out a number of technologies that you should learn. And then once you reach the bottom of the list, you are a, a senior developer. <laughs> so I, I understand that the idea is extremely compelling because uh, it becomes uh, a journey that is bite-sized and gamified and it's just about memorizing new tools. Uh, and because we are developers, we tend to have high learning capacity and a keen interest in what we're doing. So the, the prospect of just learning some new frameworks or tools is very compelling. Uh, and I'm not saying you shouldn't learn any technologies. Uh, of course, you need to know uh, something to be able to do work. Uh, but I think about it as a prerequisite so I like to say that it's required to know these things, but it's not sufficient uh, to do a, a good job. And uh, I don't place too much confidence in better tools. Uh, history has shown that better tools tend to allow us to be bigger and more complex software just as poorly as we were able to build smaller and most, more simple software previously. Uh, and the only thing that's, that's uh, creates better software is uh, improving the people. Uh, so as a disclaimer, this is some repo that has a developer roadmap. Uh, and I don't know the person who created it. And it's a great thing because it works as a reference for um, 
sort of what the ecosystem looks like right now in terms of technologies. So you can use this to get an overview, but I wouldn't treat it as a roadmap to becoming a senior developer. It's uh, probably a roadmap to something else if you follow it blindly. Uh, and that is a trap. And that trap is called uh, uh, expert beginnership. <laughs> so if, you are, um, if you've been in teaching or education, this is, uh, the bottom part is uh, uh, Dreyfus' model of skill acquisition. Uh, and when we reach the advanced beginner stage, and this is a stage of uh, just accumulating facts and putting them inside us, uh, we sort of see a fork in the road, and one of the paths leads on to be uh, more competent and beyond uh, to become an actual expert. Uh, and that path involves uh, getting uh, the big picture of what we're doing. Uh, but there is also another path, which is the trap into expert uh, beginnership. And that is treating it as uh, ourselves as sort of a bucket that just needs to be filled with more and more low-level implementation uh, details. Uh, and I, I think that this simple accumulation of facts is not really uh, enough. Uh, it has been talked about in the terms of just more and more content. Uh, but just less, letting the ideas pass through us without interacting with any of like our reactive parts uh, isn't that hard. And we need to let the ideas uh, sort of transform our understanding of what it is we're doing. So a show of hands, who, who knows about continuous integration? Okay, who does continuous integration? at work. Okay, so continuous integration is, is the act of bringing the team's uh, systems together and making sure they work together. Uh, but what is it we're actually integrating? Uh, it's not really code, uh, because that's just making the characters work together. Uh, we could argue that we're integrating our systems, uh, but when we do continuous integration, I like to think of, of it also as an integration of uh, ideas. And I, I extend this concept to myself as well. I constantly need to integrate the ideas of others with my current lattice work of ideas. And I like to think of this as uh, laying a lattice work or weaving uh, sort of a web of ideas. And I think as a junior developer, you have an advantage here. Because you can look at your seniors, and you can look at this web, and you can see these are the really nice part. I'm just going to take that and integrate it into my own. Uh, but you can also see the thorny parts, where uh, the ends don't really meet in, in my understanding and in my integration of ideas. So you can use that as a counterexample and say, oh, uh, Ted is really contradicting himself on these things, so I'm going to avoid ending up there. Whereas for me, who has been doing this integration of ideas for a very long time, changing that part might uh, take a lot of work. Uh, so just be critical. And by critical, I don't mean uh, being close-minded. Uh, I've come across junior developers who tend to reject everything uh, until they have sort of experienced it themselves or uh, inferred the things from first principles. Uh, but I think this is, is a bit of a waste of the potential of having mentors and having seniors around you uh, who have experienced things and who can warn you about certain, certain missteps. And then, of course, pick up the ideas that, that are the best ideas you have heard of so far, knowing that you will come across something better and then be ready to, to drop it. So that is actually everything I will say about uh, what not to do. Uh, so the rest of the talk I will de dedicate to talking about uh, things we can do instead, how we can reason about our work. And I think reasoning about our work is uh, how we can get better at it. And this will hopefully eventually allow uh, juniors who are at the advanced beginner stage to graduate the competent stage. 
And I'd like to start this part by asking a question. So the question is, how long is a string? And if you, have, if you think that this question is nonsensical, that is uh, on purpose, this particular question is a rhetorical device that's used in my uh, home country, which is Sweden. Uh, and we use it as a retort when someone asks us a question that doesn't have enough information or enough context to be answered in any meaningful way. And it's often paired with another saying, which is, the way you ask the question is the way I will answer it. And although we all can seem to agree that this question, without any supplementary information, is quite uh, absurd, uh, we see people ask uh, questions like this seriously, and people trying to answer them seriously. Uh, but to me, this question is equally uh, absurd. Uh, we, could, um, we could approach it with sort of an empirical mindset and say that, well, if there was a best programming language, everyone would be using it and there would only be one, right? Uh, which is not true. Uh, or we can approach it with a rational mindset and uh, see that programming languages seem to necessitate certain uh, trade-offs. And how we value those trade-offs determines how good it is or not. Uh, that is to say, uh, it is a subjective uh, valuation. And the third and absolute, the worst option is that we can approach it with uh, sort of an emotional mindset where we value our own attachments or uh, affiliations with certain program programming languages. Uh, and to me, it seems like the first option is, is the best one. Uh, having the empirical mindset, we can look at outcomes, which is uh, a very powerful uh, mental model to have to reason about the outcomes that we're looking for. Uh, and a lot of times, we don't really have enough data to make an uh, empirical uh, judgment. And we need to resort to the, the, rational, uh, the rational mode of reasoning about things. But reasoning about things is a very thorny place to be, uh, because human reasoning is, is fundamentally uh, very flawed. Uh, and especially when the emotional part comes in as well. Uh, so be very caref careful that uh, uh, rationalism can very easily turn into sort of uh, religious dogma as well. Uh, but if we're given the choice, I prefer to never have feelings about code or feelings about uh, ideas because it, it seems to be a dead end to me. It sort of locks, my, locks me in. Uh, so whenever I find myself typing in a code review, I feel I, I just t tend to stop myself and say, why am I feeling anything about this uh, very objective piece of, of the system? Uh, because it probably means I had some unexplored uh, things there. So be candid and uh, question things objectively whenever you can. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going on with the questions here. Uh, is JavaScript a bad language? Who has ever proclaimed that JavaScript is a terrible language or made jokes about it or used it as an icebreaker? <laughs> okay. Uh, so most likely the, the reason for that was uh, emotional. We had some bad experience either firsthand or we had a, heard a story from someone else about how bad their experience was. Uh, but if we try the other mindsets, empirically JavaScript is a great language because tons and tons of people are using it successfully for tons and tons of things. Uh, if we try the rational mindset, we can sort of start to articulate what, what, what are our gripes with JavaScript. Uh, so we can look at what it's used for. We use it for UI. So it's evented. That's cool. We have events in UI. Uh, but its general purpose and UI is sort of a uh, specific application, so we could probably do with something more specialized. Uh, it's imperative, which is not so nice because UIs tend to lend themselves to a declarative approach. Uh, so then we can, we can revise our judgment that it's a bad language into, it's probably a bad philosophical fit for UIs for the web. Uh, 
But it could be a great language if you are building a heavily evented and streaming system, for example. And this sort of unlocks the trap of that emotion where we look at a word or a name and we have a negative emotion and then we just try to avoid it. And I think abandoning these emotional valuations uh, and resorting to reasoning or uh, empiricism is, can yield some very important insights. So if we look at this question and we start exploring it, uh, it leads to a very important insight that programming is not really one single homogeneous discipline. Uh, and just because the different disciplines share the common denominator that we write code, uh, doesn't mean that they have the same challenges and constraints. And I think we should consider them dif different disciplines um, as a whole. And if you're a games programmer, maybe you need to know uh, linear algebra by heart. If you're a web developer, maybe you don't need to know any linear algebra, but you need to understand the, the business domain and you need to be uh, intimately familiar with user behavior. Uh, if you are building embedded applications, maybe you need to be on top of memory management and CPU cycles, uh, which is wasted effort in other applications. And I'd like to even say that programming is not about code that much. And that might be heresy. People will be like, what? Who is this guy saying that programming is not about code? There's this t-shirt that says that programmers are people who turn coffee into code. And all true wisdom is found on t-shirts, right? <laughs> uh, but I think programming is about code in the same sense that writing is about words. Uh, it's just a means that we use to express our ideas. And what is important are those ideas uh, themselves. And I think programming is about systems uh, in the same sense that writing is about stories. So, so just uh, when we are, while we're at it, uh, this this is not really a junior developer question. This is like, I want to be a developer question. So which, which language should you learn first? Any takers? <laughs> it depends. You start. <laughs> <laughs> is that the wrong question? Yeah. Is it the wrong question? English. It could be, yes. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> <laughs> OK, just send me your resume after. <laughs> OK. You should learn English because really we're, we're, we're translating uh, problems and ideas from natural language into code. And if we cannot articulate those problems or ideas in natural language, then we have a really bad starting point. It doesn't matter how good we are at writing code. So after you learn your first language, English and your first programming language, what should you learn next? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. If, if you are into like 3D programming, then that might be a good, good idea. Uh, but as, as Wei Liang pointed out, it uh, might be the wrong question. Uh, we need to ask, what do I want to do? What problems are, am I solving? Like, what kind of programming do I want to get into? And don't accept run-of-the-mill uh, universal answers to questions uh, like this, because there, there tend to be none. Uh, OK, so to explore this a bit further, we do a show of hands again. Who here would say they work in a technology company? OK, and who would say they work in a product company? OK, I have no idea what the rest of you are doing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, are no, there are no more options. Uh, but I like to differentiate between the two. Uh, and by technology company, I, I tend to mean a company where new technology is invented and where the primary constraint is the technology. And by product company, I tend to mean companies where we take existing technology and we assemble it uh, into products that solves particular problems for some field. What if you need to develop the technology to build a product? Yes. So some large companies do both. <laughs> so Google is, the most, uh, Google is the most prominent example, right? 
they create the technology, but they also build uh, products from it because they are large enough to be able to do everything. Uh, but because the constraints and the challenges are, are different, what's required from you as a senior developer is, is different. So there's no one path to, to senior developership. Uh, and anecdotally, I think this mean, misconception that programming is a single discipline uh, can lead to a, a, a sort of lack of work satisfaction. So I met uh, a lot of programmers who are quite unhappy and they are jumping from product company to product company. Uh, and they, they, are, they are very into deep technology and they don't realize that uh, these companies that they are joining are not like gated playgrounds where you can work with deep tech. They are doing something else. They are solving other, other problems. Uh, and these product companies tend to be rather open business, almost arenas that have human contexts that might not be interesting to, to those purely inter interested in tech. So I'm going to go on and talk about product companies. So if you work in a technology company, uh, feel free to, to follow along. Uh, so I like to think that all product development is, is integrated. And that is because products have many interfaces. So a product interfaces at least with different markets and with different users and with technology, which is why we have uh, different teams for uh, dealing with those uh, different interfaces. So we can have a product owner who interfaces with the market. We can have engineering team that interfaces with technology and design team that uh, interfaces with users. And these tend to answer different questions. So the product owner, and the designer can answer what should it look like. And the developer says how, what is the best approach to building this? And that work is sort of done in, in isolation, but I tend to think that the, the real magic happens in the intersections or what I call the arenas. So for example, if you have product and development come together, product knows how valuable something is and development knows how hard something is to build. And then suddenly we know what is the return on investment for building a certain thing, which informs when we should build it or in what order. But this requires us to understand the objectives and, and constraints of uh, the other functions as well. Because if we don't understand their objectives, then we cannot make the right compromises or we cannot negotiate when it's appropriate. But of course we should obsess about our own objectives the most because those are the ones we need to, to defend. So what then is the objective of the, the development team? We could be misled to think that it is value because value is our deliverable. Uh, but products are already obsessing about value. So that seems wrong. Uh, if our objectives are the same, there wouldn't be any need for negotiation in the first place. And I tend to think the objective of the development team is flow. That is, we, develop, we deliver value today and we deliver it continuously and indefinitely. And I think we should obsess about that. And the biggest threat to flow and the greatest enemy of the development team is uh, complexity. And I think all complexity added to our code base should, needs to be thoroughly examined and tested for necessity before we commit to it. This means that solutions to four problems are a big no-no. And that applies even if it means adding our own favorite uh, technology or, or pattern to, to the problem. Uh, because we all have pet solutions and technologies, but as professionals, we need to uh, sort of stuff them into a drawer and uh, wait until the right problem uh, calls for it. Because all solutions also come with their own problems and there are no such thing as a free feature or a, a free uh, framework. So I use this chart with business people to illustrate the typical trajectories for flow. Uh, the red line sort of illustrates what happens if we cut a lot of corners early on in order to achieve some short-term delivery. 
maybe we're not writing any tests, uh, we're not really doing any modeling, we're just uh, focusing on grinding out features. But if we ask the product owner, in one month from now, would you like eight units of value or one unit? They're going to say eight units. Uh, and it's important for us to protect, protect our objective of flow and explain to the product owner that if we do that, we're, we're screwed already. Which brings us to another question. I'm doing these questions just to make sure you're, you're awake. Uh, so assuming we took the red pill and now we're knee deep into the complexity, depth, and everyone is miserable. Uh, is it better to rebuild the project or to salvage it? So we can do a show of hands. How many think it's better to rebuild? Okay, how many think it's better to salvage? Okay, so I've tried both several times uh, and I will tell you the answer. So the answer to the question, is it better to rebuild or to salvage, is no. <laughs> I can tell you that both are extremely uh, miserable experiences and they are demoralizing and soul crushing and <laughs> it's not something you want to go through. <laughs> so the answer is for us to, to sort of maintain our professional integrity and defend our objective before it can happen. And this, this is extremely hard. Uh, and it can't protect us from legacy code bases that came in like, from, from elsewhere. Uh, but I think it's the only way to be uh, part of the solution. So in practice, this involves deciding on some, like, what is our maximum tolerable death level um, and make sure we don't exceed it. And I think this is mostly done by making good decisions in, in our day-to-day -day work. And I'm a strong believer in like, the compounding effects of small improvements. And the compounding effects of like, small regressions is equally powerful in the other direction. Uh, and there might be short stints of cleanup, but don't buy, into the, don't buy into the myth of the Big Bang refactoring, because it never works. Uh, because refactoring requires very deep contextual knowledge of the parts of the app you're working on. Uh, so you can't do like breadth refactoring. You have to go depth wise. Uh, and it requires you to have all the details loaded into your working memory, which uh, takes time. Uh, we need to ask ourselves when we accrue depth, why are we doing it? And this is from uh, Martin Fowler's blog. So it, it subdivides death into reckless or prudent and inadvertent and deliberate. So you can see reckless deliberate is saying things like we don't have time for design, which is, uh, this is abandoning our objective in favor of some other, other objective. Uh, there might be reckless inadvertent. Uh, as Junshi said, you this is where we need to ask questions to our senior developers because we don't know what we're doing really. Uh, it can be prudent and, and deliberate, saying we must ship now and deal with the consequences. And the key word there, there is deal with the consequences, which means we need to negotiate with the product owner. Yes, we can deliver next week, but then we need some time to recover from the debt that we incur. Uh, there's prudent inadvertent. Like we didn't know that it was going to go so bad, this approach. Uh, and as I, as I mentioned, product development has a, an acutely human context. And at some end of the chain, humans will interact with the product. And even if those humans are other developers, they are still uh, humans as well. Uh, so if you look outside your own product team, there is a sea of stakeholders that usually your product owner uh, will protect you from by being the, uh, the authority on what to build when. Uh, and these stakeholders, they provide their candidate problems for us to solve. It doesn't mean that we will solve all of them. But what they do have in common is that they are human problems. So they tend to be 
unconstrained by any form of logic or reason, because that's the nature of human problems, they tend to be fuzzy. Uh, and this matters a lot, because getting the problem right uh, is the hardest and most important part of, of the job. And getting it wrong often means imminent defeat, regardless of how beautiful the, the solution is or how flawless the, the execution, uh, because we were not, we're not solving the right problem in the first place. So no, I don't think you need to think like a computer. Uh, so there was this trend in like computational thinking and algorithmic thinking. I think mostly you need to think like a human and define them and frame them properly uh, so we can solve them. Uh, and it's to take, take ideas from the natural language that you use and turn, the, turn those ideas into code. Mostly we need strong conceptual thinkers, so, so focus on that. Instead. And because we are solving human problems, which are fuzzy and uh, not well isolated and defined, uh, like the problems we receive in school, uh, there's no magic formula really to follow. And it doesn't really help to learn algorithmic thinking. Uh, and in a way this is very nice because if, if programming was deterministic, it would be a paradox in itself because uh, programmers tend to automate things. So if programming was deterministic, we would be able to automate it and we would have automated it already and we, we would be out of jobs. Uh, so I'd like to, to show you this mental model which I used to uh, make sure that uh, we're solving the right problems, which is the most important part. Uh, so I consider three parts of any effort. I consider the diagnosis, the definition and the framing of the problem, the prescription, how we t intend to solve that problem, and the execution, which is just typing on the keyword. Uh, and I list them in order of importance. This is like orders of magnitude from the left to the right. Uh, and I think it, again, it shows the, the relative insignificance of code. Uh, uh, it's just committing the ideas that we already generated in the previous steps into, into code. And it's those ideas that matter. But you should be fluent with your uh, programming language, uh, which is not, really not that hard compared to all the other things we do. So it, it just means read up on the standard library and on the language syntax so that you can use it fluently to express ideas, just like you would uh, English. But don't be tricked into thinking that is what makes you a, a good developer. So just like l learning the entire English dictionary doesn't make you Hemingway, uh, learning Ruby's standard library does not make you uh, brilliant at, at coding. Uh, and execution is still important, and this has to do um, with partly with credibility. So Ken talked a bit about uh, spelling errors in the newspaper, and it doesn't kind of doesn't matter how relevant the story is if it's all with spelling errors. The credibility is already uh, already heard. Uh, so don't abandon it. Try to improve your execution with every uh, with every task. And this is usually uh, people can get a bit annoyed with sometimes. Uh, I'll say, it's, oh, it's just an implementation detail. Uh, and what I mean by that is we have already gone through the process of diagnosis and prescription, which are the interesting parts. How we type out the code is not that interesting to me. OK, in the interest of time, my own guidelines as we, I've just discussed. Uh, I think better, better humans beat better tools every time. Uh, and I think technical competence is required, but it's not sufficient. And I think what lies beyond technical competency is what sets you apart as a developer. Uh, always think about constraints. Uh, if you do web applications uh, and you're thinking, should I do this language level optimization to my Ruby code? The answer is no, because the constraints of 
performance is I.O. and the constraint of your team is uh, developer resources. So you're trading very valuable developer resources for um, very non-valuable work, work. But also think about constraints in, in your organization and your team. If, especially if your team is the bottleneck, because then we need to utilize the, uh, our effort wisely. Obsess about flow. Uh, make sure you're solving real problems. This is probably the most important one. Uh, and don't have feelings about code. Uh, so these are just my guidelines. You should probably develop your own guidelines as you go along. So whenever you come across an idea that is uh, especially, uh, that integrates especially well with your understanding of our work, then uh, make it your own. And I think finally, uh, we need to beat the stereotype. So uh, programming is not uh, manufacturing and you are not part of any manufacturing economy. Uh, and the, we, there is this stereotype of the code monkey. And we don't want to be code monkeys. And being the big monkey does not mean knowing the most tricks. Mm -hmm. And I think the best antithesis to the, the code monkey is, uh, is credible, uh, discerning, and reflecting uh, professionals. And professionals who uh, holds and protects their own objectives and who know when to negotiate and uh, when to compromise. And one who can tell conceptual issues from implementation issues uh, and re reframe the problem and propose other solutions. And I think it's, it's developers who know what they know and what, what they don't. So we need bold developers, as in bold, not, not bold. <laughs> uh, and of course, for everything else, there's always Stack Overflow. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. <laughs>